So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Dara. And I'm Donna. So we are two friends that started a Mahjong business. Um, if you don't know our backstory, we started with Mahjong dice because we thought that the dice should be as beautiful as the tiles. And that was in 2019. We were rolling along, sorry for the pun. Um, and then the pandemic hit and we realized that not that many people were playing in person and we really were enjoying the business and meeting everybody that we decided to take things virtually. So our first virtual tournament started back in 2020, our first Zoom. Our first Zoom, we had 24 people. And we were <laughs> thrilled that 24 people wanted to join us. And now in June of 2023, we are thrilled for the interest to learn about Mahjong. So our Zoom, we do all these at our expense. We don't charge for you to attend. We take on the expense of hosting it. Our Zoom is limited for what we pay for. So we really would like to thank Raina Sue Harris. She is the author of Bronx Tale, Jerusalem Heart. And it is a compelling drama about the Millers fighting to overcome hardships through wit, wisdom, and as their younger daughter searches for faith and reconciliation in the midst of the six day war in Israel. So in conjunction with this Zoom, we are doing a giveaway. Her contact information is there if you have more questions about the book. But the giveaway you could enter if you are on social media, find the image that shows the book and just underneath it comment your favorite place to play Mahjong. For each friend you tag, you get an extra entry. And if you are not on social media, you could email us at Modern Mahjong, it's one word, one G, at gmail.com. And if you put the subject book giveaway, we'll add your name to the list of people entering. So yep. now let me Good go. luck, everybody. Yes. <laughs> so everybody, as we told you, is muted. And now Donna will kick off our discussion. Oh, I was doing the evens. <laughs> no, you're doing the even pages or numbers. That's what I had emailed you. <laughs> so it is most important to know the card. That is the ultimate thing, whether we're talking about strategy, whether they're talking about the card, whatever, you have to know the hands on the card. However, a lot of teachers will say you do not need to memorize them. It is something that some people do. Um, we have at the beginning of every year, we have great tips. We have a card review with Barney Galasio, great tips, how to memorize. You can take a four color pen, write it down in a tracking sheet. You can take the card itself and Donna will show you her fun card, but here's my little card. Um, you could take the card That's itself. A big card. <laughs> And you could make every single hand on the card in all the combinations. That's one great way. Another thing that's really important is understand the sections. And when Donna and I were coming up with some of our strategy talks that we were having, we were saying how a lot of the same questions come up. And it's about whether you could use other numbers and other suits and things on the card. So what really kind of clicked was whether hands are sections are flexible or fixed. So certain hands, like any like numbers, are flexible. You could use any like numbers, where other sections like two, four, six, eight, you must use those numbers. So if you see that little bit.ly that's a link shortener, we go through each section and explain which ones are flexible and which ones are uh, fixed. And it really is a great way to explain to new players how to understand the card. The other thing that is exceptionally important at the beginning of the year is read the parentheses. We cannot tell you, if we had a dollar for every time somebody posted that real Mahjong was wrong because they didn't get to Paul Mahjong on the any like number concealed hand, we'd have a lot of dollars. Um, it's a concealed hand. And a lot of people didn't look at the C. A lot of people didn't look at the parentheses in Quince. Um, the second one down, the Mahjong League was very clever this year. They did two, three, four, five, only those numbers. And the reason it's only those is because it's two twos, three threes, four fours, and five fives. So those are things that you really, even before the Charleston, this applies to the entire, you know, both the Charleston and picking and throwing part of the game. Those are really crucial. Okay, so the second slide may be obvious to a lot of people, but follow the tiles that you get. So whatever your tiles you get in the Charleston, let it lead you towards a section, whether it's two, four, six, eight, one, three, five, seven, nine. Sorry, I'm letting people in. Um, and it might seem obvious, but it's not. One tip that I could tell you, it's been helpful to me. Um, 
that arrange your tiles in different ways when you get them. So don't limit yourself to two, four, six, eight. As you're getting tiles, maybe you know rearrange them to one, two, three, four, and see what you get. So don't get locked in right away if you think you only have even numbers, but just arranging them differently. So arrange two, four, six, eight, or one, two, three, four, and see if something new comes to hand if another hand hits you, um, which is a great, great tip. Yes. Okay, next. So this was something that um, Donna miller Small did some advanced um, strategies. And one of the people said, well, there are times I just get nothing. What do you do when you get nothing? And I laugh because sometimes you do look at 13 or 14 tiles and you think, I, I really don't. I have one even, one odd. I have, oops, sorry about that. Um, can't turn it off. Well, they know you're busy. <laughs> I know they do. I think everybody knows I'm on a Zoom, but it, since it goes through my computer, I can't decline it. Give me one moment. Okay. So, so don't be discouraged by a bad deal because first of all, you should understand the entire Charleston. Some people call it Rolor. Some people call it Rallar, right over left, left over right, or sometimes people say across. The first three, mandatory. And now some of you, I mean, if you've been playing for a long time, don't worry, this will get much more strategic as we go along, but we just want everybody to be on good footing throughout the whole thing. Not only that, if you teach or if you play with newbies, this might click something that you don't realize intuitive and you can use to help new players move along. So a lot of times things that are intuitive to longer term players, more experienced players, hearing it said a different way kind of clicks and helps you explain it to someone else. So blind pass is blind pass for a reason. You cannot look. Stopping the Charleston we'll get into a little bit later. Then there's left over right and the optional second Charleston and then the blind final pass. So if you think about it, you get three, six, nine up to nine and then you get three, six, nine and another three. So you get up to 21 new tiles. So starting with 13 or 14 and getting another 21, I mean, that's a huge amount of tiles to go from nothing to something. And like Donna said, as you get the tiles, you rearrange. And if we do an advanced strategy on the rest of the game, that is something we don't recommend for when you're actually playing. When you're actually playing and you're picking, don't rearrange while people are watching, but during the Charleston, rearrange. Yeah, and one of the tips I was taught is if you really think you have nothing, which happens to me a lot, <laughs> You kind of look at consecutive. So if you have like one of every tile, if you have more one, two, threes, try and look at consecutive and see if you can come up with something. Don't just say, give up, I have nothing. Right. So. And this year is great because the consecutives are in any one number and kind of stretch over a lot of numbers. So yeah, consecutive is very flexible this year. Okay. Let me just admit people. No, I'll do it while you're. Okay, so don't focus too much on building a specific hand. Um, we find a lot of people do this. So automatically, as we said, two, four, six, eight. Um, don't focus on that section alone. You have to look at what tiles you have. And as I said, maybe go to consecutive or maybe like numbers. So don't get locked in too early. Um, you can see if the tiles point you to a specific section, um, but after that, just open your mind a little more. Um, and then as you get more tiles, it'll point you in a direction, it'll narrow you in on a hand. But the first two, three passes, you may not know what you're doing. Whoops. And then uh, as you get more tiles, it'll draw you to a specific section. Okay. So this is a very lengthy one. So look to see what tiles you have that work together. So it seems obvious, but look at pairs. Sometimes people get misled because they have pairs that don't really work together. So in other years, if you had four and seven, that would kind of be pairs that don't jive. But like Donna just said, this year, the consecutive run all in one suit, four and seven do work together. But don't be misled. Let's say you have all low evens and then a pair of sevens. Mostly to make sure you're going to have tiles to pass, break up a pair that's not helpful early so you're not stuck passing a pair. Now, this was a strategy tip from a friend. What she likes to do if she has a pair that she doesn't need is she waits until the second left to pass one of those. Because if you think of the way she's sitting, she will be next in line 
if that person uses that tile to call an exposure and uses a joker. So that's kind of high level thinking of saving a pair to hopefully get the joker, kind of like an early um, joker bait. Um, look to see if you have consecutive numbers in one or more suits. Evens, odds, three, six, nine. I mean, basically I'm reading the categories, but think about the different things that you have and what fits. Lower high tiles, wins. One thing about wins this year is a lot of times, last year's, other years, I would just say wins and like numbers. Well, that works great if you have jokers because you could do the quince, but in the wind and dragon section, there are no like numbers. So um, the last concealed hand in wins and dragons has been a very popular wind and dragon hand because it kind of is a little bit of everything. You have a few wins, you have consecutive numbers in different hands. Uh, don't forget about the year hands. Now, whenever we have a year like 21, 23, 24, where the numbers are all close together, those are great years to try to hold on to. And then if you're not getting the soaps or the dragons that you need, you can switch easily to consecutive rounds. Another thing that a lot of people forget, this year the addition hands only need two flowers. So a lot of times in the past, they've needed four flowers. So a lot of people might avoid them if they don't have flowers in the beginning. If you're collecting threes and sixes and you're collecting and you're thinking you're in the three, six, nine hand, but none of the nines are coming in or the nines are in the wrong suit, addition three plus three is six is a great swap. So we get into that later in tonight's discussion, but certain tiles are really great for overlapping. They'll work for the three, six, nine hand, they'll work for the two, six, eight. So as you're organizing your tiles and as you're looking at them, you could say, well, I'll keep this because it could be helpful in many ways. Another great reason to organize your tiles with every pass is you might see something you didn't see before. And by taking the tiles, looking at them, putting them in your rack, you are not broadcasting that they're not necessary. You are not giving a tell. And we've had a lot of discussions about tells. Just like in poker, Mahjong could be very strategic that way. So if you pass three tiles to the person playing next to you, and he looks at them and he makes a face or he says, oh, I went the wrong way. He just gave you a ton of information about his hand and unless he's bluffing, great things for you to pass him the next time. So that is something that you really should think of is don't give off information, you don't have to. So you did five and six. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I, I, we, we misunderstood. I meant odd pages. You thought oh, numbers. Oh, I meant odd numbers. That's funny. So number seven is observe and remember. And I think this comes with getting more comfortable with the card and practicing more. So you always try to remember what you passed players um, and what's being passed or not. Like if you keep getting back the same tiles you pass, you know nobody wants those tiles. Um, you have to be very careful when you're doing the second left because you wanna remember what you passed on the first left so you don't pass them similar tiles that might help give them a hand. So that comes with time. I know it's overwhelming sometimes and you're like, I can't, I'm just trying to deal with my hand. I can't think of what I get to her and what they're doing. But as you get more comfortable and you play more, it's all practice um, and experience, then that'll come you know, easier. So that's what we said, start with your passes for the first left and the second left, try not to pass the same tiles. Um, as you increase your skill and strategy, you can try to expand this to the entire Charleston. But in the beginning, uh, it's a good practice to remember the first and second left. So, I mean, this may be obvious, but if you don't see any wind tiles being passed, or if you pass them and they don't come back to you, somebody's probably collecting wins. Um, a girl that we used to play with just did a lot of wind hands. <laughs> so we stopped passing those to her. You know, if you play with the same people over and over again and they only play you know, the same hands. So we're not gonna pass wind tiles to her, uh, which is strategy. Um, Darren and I've talked a lot about tells. Um, sometimes we sit on our hands, but we have gotten much better. So if I pass three tiles to my left and the person laughs and yay, or you know, um, makes a face, um, do they give them away right away? Um, Darren and I always say rack it first move them around, even if you don't need them, because someone might be watching you. Do they need that? Did they keep those tiles? Um, so these are clues that you can see what everyone else is doing. Great. So I'm just gonna back up. So there are some questions that we um, went over quickly and now I had a chance to look in the chat. 
So the blind pass you can do on the first left and the final right. And what that means is you can take your three and pass to the next person, or you could do one, two, or three passes from the person giving them to you. And the way you do it is you put however many you want to pass from your hand and you take the ones that they're giving you without looking and just pass them along. So let's say your hand, you want to continue the Charleston, but you're really not sure you want, some, you know, for some reason, you can take one, two, or three from that person and move them along. And you can't look at them. And there is no penalty under National Major League rules if you do, other than if you do and you do it all the time, people might not want to play. Um, in tournaments, a lot of times it's minus 10 points. So it's something really to get used to not looking at the pass. Um, and then the other question that I see, um, we have a frequently asked question. So this is one of them. In the consecutive run, it's um, the fifth one under. It does not say any run, but under that, that's what we were talking about, fixed and flexible. In that section, unless it says these numbers only, it's any run that can be completed. So since it's three numbers, it can be any number starting from one. You can't start with zero. Any number starting from one through seven. So we'll go back and go through those other questions when we get later. Um, okay. Jr. someone had a, Phyllis had a question. Why shouldn't you rearrange hands when playing the game after the Charleston? I don't so to me, I just, you know, we try to come up with creative things for our Instagram and Facebook. So um, we called it don't file your tile. To me, when I watch players who are very experienced and when I competitive, they're friendly, but they're very competitive. And people who are on our Facebook group know that people that follow the rules, you know, when they hear the term friendly used instead of the word lax, it's a very big discussion. But competitive players, usually by nature, pick the tile, make no expression, put it either on the right or the left, and then pick another tile and discard. By putting it in their rack and racking it and not filing their tile where it belongs, you have no idea if that tile helps them, if they have, you know, sometimes you could tell people have a ton of jokers just by the way they're putting the tile and kind of looking and moving it around to see where it belongs. And what, So the less you broadcast about what's on your rack, the better it is. Now, when we say this, there are some groups that love saying, oh my God, does this set have any jokers? Or, oh, um, you know, you must have all the jokers because I don't have any. If you find that fun and that's your group dynamic, terrific. But if you're here to learn how come you're not winning as much and how come and how to increase your skill, these are tips that we really feel people incorporate. Um, the National Mahjong League, Mahjong Made Easy, is their official instruction book. They don't call it a rule book. Um, we believe that it will be updated soon. We usually have it on our website, but since we don't want people to buy it and then it be outdated soon, we stopped having it for now. So as soon as that is updated, that will be back on our website. But they are currently working on it. So um, okay, please so, review stopping the Charleston. Um, I wish we okay, could we'll get, we will get to that. So we did a okay. study um, yeah. about the statistics of stopping the Charleston or not. Yeah, that, oh shoot, I didn't mean to just do that. Hold on one second. I don't know, okay. So um, you didn't do this part about no. Scrabble, right? Okay. No, you can do that. So when I was um, reading a book about Scrabble years ago, I thought there was a really interesting point. And it said, the tiles that remain on your rack are just as important as what to pass. For those of you who play Scrabble, if you have an S, you don't want to put an S down for a few points. You want that S to stay on your rack until you could make two words from it or get a triple or something. So similarly, when you're doing the Charleston, if you have overlapping tiles that could work for many different hands or different sections, those are important to keep. And you wanna whittle down and get rid of the ones that you know you're not gonna be using. Also, many teachers might say, never pass a flower, never pass a pear, never pass a dragon. So when you go back to your teacher and you tell them, well, Darren Donna said I could pass a flower. We're not encouraging you to pass tiles that are valuable, but just because someone else's hand finds it valuable, doesn't mean you should break up your hand to pass it. If we're on the optional and all I have is a flower and a white dragon, I probably wouldn't pass those. I probably wouldn't pass anything. But during the Charleston and during passes that I have to pass, I'm not going to break up my hand. My goal in the Charleston is get as close to a hand or a section that I can. So if it's not helping me, it's moving on. 
And I've passed some strange passes to people and I just smile and, you know, I try not to pass pairs. I try not to pass wins together. I try not to pass dragons. Um, very rarely will I pass a white dragon. Um, I would never pass a pair of flowers, but if it's not helping me, it's moving on. The reason I focus on white dragons is since they're so, they're, you know, like kind of ambidextrous. I mean, they could be the zero, they could be the dragon and they are in all the 2023 hands. So they're around a lot. And same thing with flowers, they're around a lot. Now by rule, you cannot pass a joker. So somebody asked in Mahjong community, well, what do you do? Like the person next to me, pass, you know, pass me a joker. You just politely say, oh, I don't think you mean to pass this and you give it back. Because the rule requires not only can they not be passed, but that you must return them. So, okay. Okay, so um, do you have flower tiles? It's a good strategy to know which hands on the card have either pairs or kongs of flower. This year, there are no three flower hands. So um, it's really good strategy to go through the card and see Oh, this hand is like the addition hand is all two flowers. Um, you know, just keep going on north, the wind section, three, six, nine, the second hand down is four flowers. So that's really um, important because if you have two flowers, you know, okay, I'm going to look at these hands versus three flowers and a joker or four flowers. So um, we, you know, think it's a very good strategy to look at the hands just in terms of the flowers. Um, also, if you have a lot of jokers during the Charleston, you should look at the quince. Um, you know, pairs, you can, if you have a lot of jokers, you're not going to play singles and pairs. Um, that's just what it is. So if the quint doesn't work out though, you can go to consecutive run or some other hand, but definitely if you have a lot of jokers, you should look at the, the quint hand and don't waste your time looking at pairs because you're not going to give those jokers away and you don't want them to go to waste. And also, like if you have a lot of jokers, um, sometimes I would avoid looking at the two, three, four, five hand or know that it's very similar to the second consecutive run because it's really frustrating if you have jokers and you're just waiting on a pair. Okay. So we were just talking about jokers and now back to singles and pairs. Singles and pairs is a section that I would say a lot of players take a long time to warm up to. Some people don't even look in the bottom right. And it really is an important section. I actually, my thought process is unless I have a lot of jokers, that's where I start. I start with singles and pairs. And then if things aren't coming in, then I look to see what it correlates to. So if you look at the singles and pairs, every single one of the hands correlates to another section on the card. And we actually did a PDF of backup hands and we go through each hand on the card and what hands those are switchable to. You're really not worrying about switchable hands this early in the Charleston because you're really just building a hand itself. Backup is more of once you're picking and throwing, but it's good to know which hands kind of correlate to each other. So if you're doing the two, four, six, eight in singles and pairs on the fourth one down, you know that's very similar to two, four, six, eight, or the fourth one down in two, four, six, eight. So it's very helpful to be able to kind of flop. And I think that we did a chart talking about levels of play. And to me, that is something that really separates an advanced player from uh, other players. Um, if you do not receive our newsletters with all these strategy and stuff tips, you can sign up on modernmajon.com. We share rules, strategy, we talk about our gifts and our accessories. And this is um, Donna and I worked, Donna Miller Small did a talk about switchable hands and that got us started. And then Linda Sachs reviewed it. So it's a whole, I think it's like 20 pages of just great backup hands. And I found it very helpful for my game. And if you don't go on Facebook and you're not on social media, if you go to modernmajan.com, if you scroll to the bottom left, we have all different directories and you could see rule and strategy posts. We try to remember to share all the ones we share on Facebook there. And then on the very bottom is learn the 2023 card. So those are all links to printables. And we try to make um, some of the printables as easy to print and less ink and color. So you could share them or email them to friends. Hey, Dara, Leslie asked if you could put the 10, 11 page again. So the slide with sure. number 10 and 11. Yes. Of course. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, no. So in. actually, yeah, we'll just take a break for a second. And um, when we get to the end, we'll go back over questions and actually so, well done. Is yeah. Reading. So Barbara said no wins and single and pairs. Absolutely. It's a good observation. So if you have a lot of wins, you're not going to do singles and pairs. Okay, that's you. I'm just looking at Marsha. All sections have only one hand with four flowers, except addition hands and singles and pairs. Absolutely. Which um, is great to know because that's the other thing. I mean, I know this is about the Charleston, but once you see someone put up four flowers, as soon as they put up a second um, exposure, it you pretty much narrows down what they're doing. So. Let me just go back. So if you know someone's collecting wins, would you hold them back in the optional or only pass two? So we talked about one of the girls we played with only did win hands, so we held them back. <laughs> we didn't pass I mean, she's for her. Good. She really doesn't do win hands that much anymore. Right, because she caught on and we knew that's what she was doing. I mean, there would be a day where she would win four win hands and we're like, all right, we're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, okay. All right, we appreciate all the freebies that you share. Thank you, oh, Nan. Okay. That's very nice. <laughs> That's directly nice. It. Um, so one rule is imp very important is be flexible. Like we said before, don't say I'm gonna do one, three, five, seven, nine, and that's it. Um, the section you could be really flexible in is consecutive run. Um, it has different suits and lots of different hands that you can do consecutively. So we always say, if you're collecting consecutive numbers, a Pong Kong, Pong Kong hand makes a great universal backup. So three, four, three, four. And that's also an important way. I know people say Pong Kong, Pong Kong. You can say three, four, three, four. So as you're studying the card and learning the card, you learn the rhythm of it. So this hand, the second one in consecutive run is three, four, three, four. So you'll start to see a pattern in it. And I think that's a very helpful. When uh, collecting your tiles, sometimes you don't even have to look at the card where you can focus right in on what you have. Yes. Okay. So, so somebody had asked about stopping the Charleston. So you can't win on two different hands at once. And a lot of times when players are confused about, should I keep going? Should I stop the Charleston? A lot of times it's because they can't decide and they have two, four, six, eight, and one, three, five, seven, nine. And they have both and they don't want to give anything up. So we did a study, we asked players, and we know it's not scientific, but we asked players, anytime somebody that they were playing with stopped the Charleston, not then, wait until the game was over, but find out why they stopped it. Were they between two hands? Did they have three or fewer tiles to pass? Did they only have tiles they thought were valuable, whether they were dragons, flowers, white dragon wins? And did they only have tiles they didn't want to pass together? And the results, I'm going to zoom in. Basically, the only time it helped to stop the Charleston and win was when they had less than three or few door tiles to pass. And in that case, 11 out of the 28 times they won. Every other time, stopping the Charleston did not help. And, you know, if you think about the Charleston, if you stop it, you miss out on another three, six, nine, 12 tiles, up to 12 tiles. If you continue going, as long as you could do that first left, the only other pass you need to make is a cross because the final right, you could do the blind pass we talked about and the courtesy, you could say no. So it really does not make sense for the most part to stop it unless you are that close. And, um, what do you do if someone stops it? So I know a lot of people who were new thought it was somewhat um, competitive or cutthroat. If somebody says, I'm stopping the Charleston, and then they say, oh, do you want two? And the person across them says, no. For the most part, most people laugh. If they stop the Charleston and offer you a tile, they, they laugh. They know you're not going to give it to them. So it's not cutthroat. It's just if they're stopping and you know their style of play, and you know they only stop it for the right reasons, then why help them win? Um, on the other hand, if you know a player stops it because they're indecisive, then it might be no harm, no foul. So it really depends on your style, on your risk taking, um, how competitive you are. You know, there's a lot of factors. 
The other thing is on the courtesy pass, do you pass a tile that you don't need, but it's valuable to other people? So if you have every other tile that you need towards your hand, but a flower and a white dragon, I would think most people would decline passing that. However, if you feel lucky and you think you're going to get it, you know, it, it's really a nuanced decision there. But I would think most people would hold those back. Right. Um, Dara, Nan asked if you could please zoom in on the when is it too late to stop the Charleston? Oh, of course. Great. So somebody the other day had asked in Mahjong community, they got mad at me because I wanted to stop after they already took their tiles. So that's what the rule is. If somebody already looks at their tiles, it's then too late to stop. It's optional, but it, the onus is on the player that wants to stop to say, I want to stop. So the best practice in here, and this isn't a rule, but the best practice is if you have your tiles in front of you and you take three and you're passing them and you realize that all the other tiles on your rack are good for your hand, just say to everybody, please go slow. I might be stopping. Yes, you're broadcasting a little information, but it's better to give that information out than to continue and not be able to stop the Charleston. And I think it's very helpful to do it that way. Some players feel like it's better if they just always say to each other, are we continuing? Are we continuing? You'll notice in tournaments and in a lot of more experienced players, they don't want to slow the game down with that. So it all depends on your group dynamic again. I'm not saying that the way Donna and I are saying it has to be done. But for the most part, faster players don't want to take that moment to stop. They just want the person who is going to stop to say, please ho hold off a second. I might want to stop. And I just want to say something. So um, we're assuming that you play with the same people all the time and you kind of know right. the hands they play. And then, But if you're playing with new people and someone stops the Charleston, you do not exchange, you know, the optional exchange with them. You just don't. I mean, because you don't know the nuance, whether they're stopping the trust for the right reason or they're indecisive. So, you know, all of this has to be taken into account, whether it's people you play with regularly or, you know, different groups and new people. It just, what you just said made me laugh. Like, it, it's almost like for anybody who plays like um, blackjack and you're wondering if you're hitting or stopping and if you're gonna make the other people at the table upset. If you're at a tournament and somebody stops and you pass, you're gonna get a lot of looks from other players. Now that's not to say that should be the reason not to pass, but most people would be surprised to see you pass. So Barbara asks, you're talking about on the first left to say, go slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, cause, cause you know, you're gonna get the first left. You're depending on if you're East or not, you're gonna have 14 or 13 tiles. Everybody will wait. So the rest of the game, it's etiquette to wait. We did a whole thing on etiquette. It's etiquette to wait until everybody has their 14 or 13 tiles in the beginning to put your tiles on your rack. Once the game starts, you just must pass your tiles before you put yours on the rack, but there's no rule that you have to wait for everybody to have their three in their rack to do that. So just to get everybody on the same page, just say, please slow down after you take your first left and then I'll let you know if we wanna go along. And then just for those of you who missed it today, um, somebody was asking about stacking. So once you do the first left and you say, no, no, I'm good to continue, it's tradition, not a rule, to put three tiles, I don't know if I'm gonna be on camera for this because I don't have myself on the screen, but to put three tiles in a little pyramid or a little house for the second left. And that just lets people know that the second part of the Charleston starting. Somehow over the years, some people do it on the entire second Charleston, usually it's just the second left that that happens. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. So Darren and I have worked really hard on this. We've done um, a lot of Zooms, a lot of social media posts on this. And I am definitely one of these people. Um, have a poker face. So if you get tiles you don't like, don't be like, oh, I never get anything or like make a face. Or if you get tiles you do like, don't be like, yay, you know. Just really try to focus. I mean, we've speak to Michelle Frizzell. We've played with Michelle Frizzell. There's no talking. Like you're getting your tiles and you're focused. So try not to smile, frown, you know, move your eyes, whatever it is you do. Um, Darren and I talk about sitting on our hands sometimes. So you're not like, you know, leaning forward, like, oh, I like that. So you can look at what your tells are and try to avoid those. 
So the idea yeah. is don't call attention to what you're passing or whether the tiles you got are helpful um, because you're giving away very valuable information about your hand. Yeah, and it's funny what Donna brings up. We had um, Karen Gouin on, who some people know as Bubby Fisher, and she was talking about how there's coffee mahjong and wine mahjong. And I think now in, in other states, I think there's coffee, wine, and cocktail. So if your group thinks it's fun to laugh or make fun, that's your dynamic and that's great. But if you're wondering how come people know what hand you're playing or how come people know that you're one away, I never realized until, well, I hadn't realized until a little while ago that when I was set, my posture improved and leaned closer to the table. It was just subconscious. And all of a sudden I realized I was doing it. So now I either try to have better posture the whole time or I try just not to lean in. Another thing, just not Charleston, but when you're in the game, if you see somebody always picking and racking, picking and racking, and then all of a sudden, rather than picking and racking, they're just picking and discarding, picking and discarding, you pretty much know that they're one away. So just different things that people do, starting with the Charleston throughout the whole game is great tells. Right, okay. Let's look at some of the questions that came in. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm afraid says, to look at the chat right now just yeah. because I think it's going to um, take away my screen. Wendy says, one of the things I do when I am teaching is to put up three or four tiles, for example, four, 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 and then ask my students to tell me which hands I could be doing. This seems mm -hmm. to help them learn the card and sections faster. Yes. So that's a good, good That's idea. great. I'm sorry, I'm letting people in at the same time. Um, okay. Wait, hold on a minute. Come back. Um, Shelly O'Neill says, what do you do in the event someone at the table passes before everyone has finished the last pass, especially if they start the second round of Charleston and someone has picked up their tiles and theoretically can't stop the Charleston? So this is what we talked about going slow, right there? Or saying slow yeah, down. No. Yeah, definitely. It's really important to just tell people to go slow or in that case, maybe you could say, oh, you know what? I get a little confused when we're not all on the same page. Can we slow down the passing and just make sure everybody starts at the same time? Right. I mean, look, it's communication is key. So if you're playing with people, you're allowed to speak up and you're allowed to say, you know, wait, go slower, you know, let me think. And, and it's fine, you know? As long as you're nice yeah, and there's no them. rule lisa was asking it's 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 just a table rule to wait until everyone has passed before you look at tiles it's not it's it's proper etiquette to wait till everyone has the tiles i would never pick my tile and put my first four and would until everybody has their 13 and 14. but once the game starts then it's you could look at them as as long as the tiles have left your rack then you could look at your pass and the pdf um there's all different PDFs that we've shared on modernmajon.com on the left-hand side. And yes, we will be sending this out, kind of like a more detailed version of this out. Everybody who is registered to our email address on modernmajon.com. And also if you've joined this, we will. if you're not registered, it might be hard because um, through Google, we only have a limited amount of email. So definitely if you haven't registered for our emails, that's one way to guarantee you'll get it. Another way is we will share it on Facebook. So Susan is saying someone in her group talks a lot. Um, so we try to say to people during the trust and during the game, be focused, be quiet. And then as you're shuffling the tiles in between games, you can talk, get up and get a drink, but talk after the game is over. And there's nice ways to say that. And, you know, that's it. Vicky says someone in my game taps her toes when she is close. <laughs> It's that's funny the that's things great. that people do. And, and now that you're aware of it, you'll look and you'll right. observe people. And it's very funny. So Jennifer, this was great. Um, the first dot under 14, I'm glad you clarified this. We're not saying to go for one specific hand during the Charleston. Like Donna said in the beginning, really try to focus on a section. You don't have to pin down one specific hand. Usually when players want to stop the Charleston, it's because they are completely in two different ways. So they might have six tiles towards one and six towards another and one overlap or two overlap. You can't win on both of those hands is what that was referring to. So you don't have to pick um, the one hand you're going for, but 
if you're stopping the Charleston so you could continue trying to win on two, four, six, eight, and one, three, five, seven, nine simultaneously, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> and basically, so this is kind of something that I guess I shouldn't admit, but your the goal of Mahjong is to get a winning hand. And then the second goal is to force a wall game. However, we don't have a kitty in our group. We don't do that. So I actually kind of think wall games are a little boring. I get excited when players win and friends get a new hand. And win. However, you are, you're handicapping yourself if you're stopping the Charleston because you haven't picked a section is maybe a better way to say that. So maybe I should change that. You can't win on two sections at once. So I, don't, I hope that clarified that. I mean, Darren, I talked about it for me. I mean, I'm happy when somebody wins. I just don't want to be the person that throws that tile to them so they win. I'd rather have a wall game and be strategic and defensive right. and nobody wins. <laughs> if I'm not going to win, no one's winning. But I just don't want to be that person and I kind of force a wall hand. A so wall this is a great question. Um, Allie plays with someone who stops every Charleston. You can show her. I mean, we have the, yeah, the statistics. statistics challenge. You could show her the statistics. I mean, it's not helping her. Or maybe have her keep her own statistics. Have her track how many times she wins when she stops the Charleston. You know, does it help? So yeah, nicely, obviously. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't win, don't lose. So yeah, that's another, uh, uh, Heidi would love a Zoom on strategies on how you build a hand. Um, yeah, Jennifer, so, you read Jennifer, right? So yeah. Phyllis asked, if you only need one tile for Mahjan and you believe the tile you have will give someone Mahjan, do you deliberately break your hand? So in Mahjan Made Easy, they actually call something called dogging, which I had never heard that used as a term before. So you are, the game of Mahjan, official rules, you are supposed to play defensively till the very end. Every pick and throw should be defensive. So if somebody has an obvious exposure, you are not, so you're supposed to break up your hand. You are um, towards the end. If you have uh, 11 tiles and you're not going to win, there's only a few more tiles to lift and you know you have jokers and you have enough that you could discard, that's what you should discard. If you have to break up your hand, but you know you're not going to win, you're supposed to break it up. It depends though. I kind of feel like people's personalities are shown at the table. So some people will take that gamble. It, ju it just depends. If I early, early on think that somebody for some reason was really early in putting things out, I might throw a tile that they probably need thinking that they wouldn't have enough jokers at that point to call the other tile I'm throwing. And I want to get rid of it quickly. When it gets towards the end, I'm more likely to break up my hand. So. I mean, I break up my hand. I mean, I, as I said, I, I don't want to throw the winning tile. That to me yep. is the worst. <laughs> so even though I'm one or two tiles away, but I know I'm not going to win, I'll break up my hand. Right. You know. And then the other thing is the Maja League has no hot wall or cold wall. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of those, those are house rules in hot wall usually. So when you roll the dice and you deal the tiles, the tiles left over, and we're going to actually do a post on this tomorrow, are supposed to stay exactly where they were to continue a snake of the tiles. You know, it should be one. Don't move them all the way over because then people probably won't see them as clearly. Those tiles are just the dice wall. There's, there's no name for them. If you play in a hot wall and someone throws a hot tile or throws the winning tile, there's it's a house rule, so there's all different rules. You usually pay for the table. So... That's something that another rule would be you have to account for a certain number of discards or you pay for the table. In a cold wall, it's the opposite. You could throw anything you want once you get to that because the only way you could win is by picking your own Mahjong. So that kind of, I find that Mahjong has two components or three, the Charleston playing offensively and paying defensively. And I find that cold walls kind of take out that element of defense. So- we don't Those are play things. that way. Darren and I do not play with a hot or cold wall. So, so yeah, so anyone asking, we will be sharing this on YouTube after. Okay, so, so um, we were on 15, we did that. I say, do you play differently when, Barbara said, do you play differently when betting than not? I mean, I do. I, mean, I think it's more fun. Um, you know, it's 25 cents usually, 50 cents. 
Um, a lot of friends of mine in California take the winning and they put it all in one pile. At the end of the year, they all go out to lunch together, um, which is a nice idea. But I think you do play more defensively, even though if you might lose 25 cents, I, I personally think it's more fun to play. But don't play in a restaurant that we got kicked out of the other day because we were gambling. We were gambling. And Florida, we're not giving legal advice, but it is allowed in Florida under a certain amount. But we, we said, okay, and we left. But yeah. Oh, okay. I'm pet sitting. Um, so now for the next one, we're play defensively. So, so obviously avoid passing three tiles together that are helpful. So helpful could be pairs, could be consecutive numbers. Really, if you follow this list, you're not going to be able to pass anything because obviously, you know, things can be helpful depending on what hand people are going for, but there's more and less helpful than others. So most teachers discourage passing a flower or pairs. Think of the tiles you're passing. Are they helping build a hand? If you're doing two, four, six, eight, and you could break it up and do one, two, and then another number, a seven, and then one wind, just try to break things up. So basically what I say is I'm not passing you a hand, you know, um, try to mix up evens, odds, high, low. Um, if you happen to be far enough along that you know you're not doing wins, I very rarely would pass two wind tiles. However, if I have to, I would do, let's say it's like the, the mandatory across. I would try not to do north and south together or east and west together because there are some hands that only have north, south or east, west. Right. So I would try to break that up. So just consider if the tiles that you're passing work in the same hand and contrast that with are the tiles you're keeping flexible. Are they able to be used for many hands or at least for the hands that you're keeping? And I also wouldn't pass uh, cracks with red dragons. If you are passing dragons, and sometimes you have to, just try not to pass the dragon that goes with the suit of the tiles you're passing. So, I mean, the most important thing in getting better at the game is being flexible and knowing backup hands. So as Dara said, we have a bit.ly, you click on it and get your ideas for backup hands. So this is really important. I can't and this is a bad image of it. This is just <laughs> one of the pages. Can you? Yeah. Um, if you look at all the section, most of them have a flexible hand or two hands that don't require singles, pairs, dragons, or flowers. So just take a look at the sections and see backups within the section and which are flexible, which is important. Um, yeah, look for the Pong Kong, Pong Kong patterns, like we said, which is three, four, three, four. Um, so if you know that pattern, three, four, three, four, and you get certain tiles, you can even know without looking at the card, whether it's a viable hand or not. I can't read that. <laughs> I can't read that. <laughs> no, I'm trying to go to the next page. Okay. So basically have fun. If the tiles aren't coming your way during the Charleston or during picking and throwing, remember that another game is around the corner. So most teachers would say, play defensively, push for a wall game. So we hope that a lot of you found tips either to improve your game or if you're teaching to help share with other players. We have a lot of other Zooms coming up. Um, June 25th, for those of you, I put on my Canasta hat, um, for those of you who play Canasta or are learning Canasta, we have Canasta Live, Game On Live. The other Donna Miller that I work <laughs> with, are, the two of us are gonna do Canasta games on Real Canasta. On July 12th, we're gonna take what we did today and we're gonna put it on our dance card. So you have a bunch of dance instructors and we have other ones joining after this. So Donna Miller Small is gonna do our July 12th event. August 19th is gonna be Karen Gouin, otherwise known as Bubby Fisher. And then September 6th, this is something that came about from our virtual vintage. If you haven't, if this is the first time you're watching one of our Zooms, we do a series called Virtual Vintage and the sets that you see in these are just phenomenal. So during one of them, a lot of questions came up about how do you know what to look for in a set? How do you know where to buy from? And it's kind of just a buyer beware. So we're gonna be doing that about collecting vintage sets with Greg Swain, Toby Sock, Karen Robertson, and Teresa. So if there's other Zooms that you would like us to cover, we would be happy to email us. Um, our tournament is starting. We do a virtual tournament or an in-person tournament at your own location. You guys could play in person and send us your scores. 
you guys, you could win Amazon gift cards, modern Mahjong gift cards. If you have a foursome, because it's kind of too late for us to pair individuals, but if you have a foursome, you could still register. If you need any information, send us an email or go to our website. Okay. I, I, um, this is yeah, go ahead. I just wanted some questions came up. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Here's about our Zoom. If you are in South Florida or will be in South Florida, join us at the Bridge Club. We are having brunch and then social games, either Mahjong or Canasta. You could register as a group. And then this is a cute little image we did the other day. If it wasn't for Mahjong, I would have never met you and you and you and you and you. I love our Mahjong community. So Donna and I really enjoy doing all of these talks. And now I will turn yeah, it over. Yeah, there's a to bunch of questions. I just want to see if we can get to some of them. Yeah. Um, Marcia said, oh, Maj is not gambling, waging is a bet, winning is still not. Marcia says, I think in Florida, it's allowed to play for money if your pie is under $10. Yep. Your group should make sure you have bail money. <laughs> Darren and I were playing in a restaurant the other day. They let us play for a while. And after a while, the manager said, we're not allowed gaming, gambling. So we were asked to leave. <laughs> so, um, and in the 1920s, you know, my husband's grandmother, I was born in Miami Beach. Miami Beach women were uh, arrested for gambling, not just Mahjong, but other gaming and were arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, Barbara says, when we are towards the end, most of us don't even rack the tile we pick if we don't need it to keep the game fast. What do you think about this idea? <laughs> and we say, I mean, rack it. I mean, absolutely. And then figure it out. So somebody was asking about the benefits of the white dragon. So that was Paula. Just that the white dragon is very useful because it's not only a dragon, but it's soap. So since it's in so many, it's very versatile since it's in so many different categories, you know, it's a very, it's a valuable tile, it's, you know. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can repost the book giveaway, of course. And then um, if you stay around, if you have to sign off, we understand because we went a little long but we are gonna open up real canasta and just play around. So here is the book giveaway. So you can go to Mahjong community or you could email us at modernmahjong at gmail.com. So Wendy asked, do we know why Mahjong is considered a Jewish game? So actually it's very interesting. Um, the, the women that founded the league in New York City um, were Jewish women, but when um, a woman named Annalise Hines, Dr. Hines, she was asked that by her aunt who played, but wasn't Jewish, but played with a lot of Jewish women. And she thought like everything else, it would just be a quick Google search and she would get the answer. And it wasn't a quick Google search. So actually um, we have another YouTube that you could watch. If you search Annalise Hines, Modern Mahjong on YouTube, she wrote a book called Mahjong, A Chinese Game and the Making of Modern American Culture. And it is really interesting just to see the short st story is that the Mahjong League was founded on friendship and charity. And that has a lot of reason. Uh, Hadassah sold the card. Um, for those of you who don't know, Don and I, as of the end of this year, will have raised $100,000 for the Alzheimer's Association thanks to the Mahjong League and all the people that have bought their pre-order card from us, as well as we donate a dollar for every purple dice that we sell and we donate and, uh, from our tournaments. Yeah, and Chris Lloyd donated a set that we were able to raffle off and we raised a lot of money. Yeah. So, so but so here's Annalise's something. book in case anyone wants to get a picture of it. Yeah. So. Annalise Hines, H-E-I-N-Z. Yeah. So... So now let me stop this share. Just so you know, a few people have said, I missed the first two slides. I missed this. You know, we are, we're recording this and we will put it on our YouTube channel in the next few days. So you yeah. can always rewatch it then. Yes. Uh, and it's going to be long. It might take a little while. Um, so now. But All right, Trudy, if you have any questions that we were unable to get to, please feel free to send us an email, modernmajan at gmail.com. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Have a great night.